This talk actually is the result. Uh, it just reports on some res ongoing research um, uh, I'm conducting with some colleagues uh, from, from three universities, so Imperial College London, European University, uh, European U University Institute in, in Florence, and in Bologna University. Uh, we started more or less two years ago working on uh, this issue. And these are some preliminary results. Basically, this research has two purposes. The first is to develop a new method. And second, to apply this new method to the problem of legal compliance. So in fact, the talk is divided into two parts. The first part is more concerned with uh, the methodology. And the second part is more concerned with cases. Um, I will give you some, uh, some introduction to the, the idea of social simulation, for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with the topic. Uh, social simulation is uh, mainly concerned with modeling, uh, uh, modeling the problem of social interaction, uh, which, by the way, could be modeled in theory uh, using uh, theoretical uh, models like game theory or social choice theory. Um, so usually, uh, social simulation is not the first choice you have. Uh, but many, very often, there are some problems right, in th with, uh, with theoretical models like game theory and social choice theory. Uh, for example, mathematical models, uh, although they are robust, they are not sufficient for make reliable predictions. They are not able to handle very complex and sometimes uh, not tractable problems. Or sometimes you simply need to, to search for some testing of your theory or sometimes you, you are interested in non-optimal behavior, right? So game theory usually, for example, uh, uh, um, try to uh, 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 reconstruct a social interaction in terms of optimality, some types of optimality. Um, but some, you know, we can handle, we should handle, and understand also social interaction where, where it's not focused on optimality. Um, when, when your mathematical model is not sufficient, then you you have to uh, run experiments. Uh, the first choice is to run experiments with humans, right? Unless, uh, at least if you want to explain social interaction in terms of uh, interaction uh, among humans, right? But the point is that sometimes social interaction happens in so large population, for example, thousands, millions of humans. And it's very hard to run experiments in that field. And so, comes uh, social simulation. Social, social simulation is an option when you, your mathematical theory is not, is not enough, and when you don't handle the problem uh, by simply uh, testing humans. Um, Agent-based simulation is, 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 is a, is a subfamily of uh, social simulation. It's basically is the uh, result of intersection of three different domains. Social science, of course, so uh, all, all people working in agent-based simulation try to use or handle concepts and try to solve problems coming from social science. Um, agent-based computing is a new paradigm within AI. The idea is, is that uh, in AI we have distributed intelligence, so we don't longer have a single super brain computing everything, but we, you have distributed intelligence, so you have many small brains interacting together, this is much more, uh, uh, much more efficient, right? Uh, and the third one is computer simulation, which is basically a method used in physics, for example, uh, in many fields, right? So the intersection between these different uh, fields leads to agent-based simulation. Um, in agent-based simulation, there are two main paradigms. The first paradigm is called macro-simulation, uh, macro simulation techniques are typically based on mat very robust and powerful mathematical models, for example, based on statistical thermodynamics, where basically the social system is, is treated as a whole, right? It's treated as a whole with some overall f uh, features, uh, uh, characteristics, and is modeled. Uh, basically, the, 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 the characteristics of a population are averaged together. And this set of individuals is viewed as a structure with a number of variables. And this type of model is inspired by physics, right? So the idea behind macro simulation is that society, society of agents, 
can interact like particles in a thermodynamic uh, system, for example. Okay? Um, the advantage of this model is that it's very powerful, so it is able to handle huge population, millions and millions of, of agents. And these techniques are used, for example, for simulate traffic in, in, in big cities. When you drive in your city, th th there was someone who tried to understand what's going on in, you know, in the network of roads, and they run simulations right, to understand how to frame the traffic uh, flows in the, in the city. So, so you have millions of particles interacting together. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is that it is not particularly detailed in specifying the agents. So agents are basi basically treated as particles, right? Uh, the other uh, uh, paradigm is called uh, mi uh, micro simulation. Uh, micro sim is, ba is based on micro simulation techniques where the, the, the attention is paid to the specification of agents. In, in other words, in this approach, agents are specified in terms of mental states, intentions, goals, something like that, right? So it's much more detailed, but the point, the, 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 the limit so is much more detailed, but the, li the limit is that it's not computationally powerful, right? So it cannot handle large population. So the first purpose of, of, of our research was to develop a method which combines both, tries, tries to, which tries to propose uh, a, a detailed specification of agents, but exploiting very powerful techniques from, from uh, macro sim simulation, right? Uh, what we did, this is a methodological part of the paper, or the, pa or the talk, is we basically combine um, a qualitative component with a quantitative component. The qualitative component is, comes from logic. Logic, the, a declarative language like logic, you know, is meant to represent in a very intuitive way uh, the cognitive profiles of agents. So we describe the mind of agents, let's say, artificial agents, of course, uh, using logic. But uh, very efficient, computationally efficient logic. Uh, and, but you, you will also use um, quantitative method, right? So we combine probability theory, basically. And we also have a temporal component. You know, this is important because, of course, in social simulation, you actually have a dynamic uh, evolution of the of social system, so in, you need also to handle uh, temporal reasoning. Uh, and the, we believe that is a good is a good idea because actually logic is able is able to to, to be understand understood uh, intuitively. So it's a good way for exchanging uh, opinions between different disciplines. Right? Social simulation is very multidisciplinary uh, research domain. Right? We have we have social scientists, philosophers, logicians, computer scientists. You know, a lot of thing, a lot of people working together. Um, and we apply that to uh, no, the problem of norm emergence, legal compliance, and as well as uh, um, uh, um, uh, modeling exogenous norms. OK, so a couple of uh, technical uh, the intuition behind the framework. The framework it combines two different ideas, different uh, core ideas. The first is the feasibility, and the second is uh, probability. Uh, the feasibility is nothing but a way for modeling bounded rationality, what, what we heard this morning, right? Uh, according to John Pollock, a philosopher, a logician, right? Uh, mm, the feasibility is the idea that a relationship, uh, the, the relationship of support between premises and conclusion is tentative, can be revised. You know that, you know, the classical example, you know, uh, birds fly. So I tentatively conclude that the uh, uh, birds fly, but you know, if I have a penguin, penguin doesn't fly. Penguin doesn't fly. So I revise my conclusion, right? Um, so this is a way for for modeling bounded rationality because actually you don't know everything. You have a limited amount of time for reasoning, but you first conclude what you think is more plausible, and then you eventually revise it. Okay. Um, so this is basically what I said, and. Uh, one important issue in the feasibility is that the feasibility, this is the other side, the other side of the coin, is that the feasibility is used, is used for not only for handling bounded rationality, but also for handling conflicts. You know, the feasibility is a technique, a reasoning technique, which is able to have inconsistent knowledge bases. We may have, for example, which is typical in the law, you know, 
we may have conflicting norms. I think we, 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 there are lawyers here. Lawyers know very well that the uh, you know, legal system may, in, may contain a lot of conflicting norms, right? Or is it, divisible reasoning is also able to handle so-called uh, cognitive dissonances, so the fact that you have mental states that are not, complete, that, that are not compatible, right? From a technical point of view, handle this stuff is not easy, right? Should be taken for granted. Of course, can conceptually we, we all understand, but the point is when you want to develop a system which is, is running a computer, you need techniques that work, okay? So the feasible reasoning has the advantage of handling uh, modeling uh, boundary rationality and also handling conflicts in the knowledge base. But why we need also pr uh, probability? Because suppose you have a knowledge base, a piece of information. This piece of information is fixed, doesn't change. It's not completely reliable, you know, because we have bounded rationality, we have a limited um, uh, ability to access uh, knowledge. But it's fixed for some reason. Well, the feasible reasoning is not able to, you know, to revise conclusion unless some further information is added. In other words, if you have a fixed uh, base of knowledge, you continue to derive the same, the, same, the same conclusions, right? Because the feasible reasoning for revising conclusion needs further information, right? Um, but our point was to run simulation is in, no, in a non-deterministic environment. So where you don't, ba basically you don't know what will happen, right? You, you are not able to make a certain prediction, right? So we need also probability. And the probability uh, can be read in different ways. This is a, t a problem, right, uh, already, uh, which is not yet uh, clarified in the literature. But um, in this context, you can read probability in different ways. You can read the probability measure in terms of pr measures of plausibility or uh, probability is a measure for understanding whether a certain piece of information will be used by the agent in order to act, okay? Uh, in my mind, I could have a, a rule, you know, governing my behavior, saying that if, 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 uh, if there is sunny day, I will go to the sea, okay? This is something which is not certain. I could use it, this, this uh, policy, for, for activating my behavior, but I could not use it, right? So the probability is a measure for establishing how likely I will use that rule for governing my behavior, for deliberating, for example, for acting. So the structure, uh, the, 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 the framework has, has both sides of the, of the coin, you know, the feasibility and probability. Okay, I can skip, okay, I, I promise I will give you a, only two slides with formulas, but you know, and then we will go to pictorial stuff. But I need to show that to give you the flavor of what we have in the framework, right? This is the logic. This is a language of the logic we, we, we use in order to represent concepts. We have different st stuff. Okay, the first expression says that it holds from the viewpoint of agent I, agent is, is a player, is the actor, is, is uh, agent playing, uh, uh, interacting with the other agent in, 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 in the, in the framework, right? It holds from a viewpoint of agent I at time t, remember, look, uh, subscript, subscript, uh, superscript uh, uh, represent both, uh, both aspects. So it holds from a viewpoint of agent I at time t, that gamma. So basically, think about the belief, right? Agent I at time t believes that gamma is true, okay? Uh, we may have as a, super, as a subscript also objectively, because one thing is when a, a, an agent believes something, but we, you may also have that some gamma is objectively true, independently of agents. When you have the second type of expression, basically you describe the environment in an objective way. Then we have expression like this, the agent I is attempting, attempting at time t to bring about gamma, so it's an attempt to bring about some state of affairs, actions, basically. And then we have obligations. We have objective obligations and subjective obligations. Because the, oh, you may have exogenous norms, but you may have also mental norms. And this is important when you want to, for example, you want to uh, model norm internalization, right? 
Then, using that component, uh, I will promise, this is the last slide with, with formulas, with the, those components, we have rules. Rules are what we use to, to model the, how the system works in, term, in, in the qualitative part of the, of the system, right? And we have different types of rules. We have sense, sensor rules. Sensor rules are rules that state, I will, I will explain later what we mean by this. Just focus now on the, on, on the, on the rule, right? If gamma 1 and gamma n holds, then gamma holds in the perspective of agent i. Gamma 1 and gamma n are, are facts, ex external facts. So I perceive something as an agent i, and this induces in my mind the belief old gamma. Okay? Uh, then one, once you, we have mental states, there are some rules governing the internal point, pa part of agent, the mental profiles of agent. So mental rules are rules where you have antecedents, uh, which are mental states, and conclusions, which are mental states as well. Then we have actual rules where the antecedent can be mixed, but what you have is, is, is an action or refraining from action. Plus minus means, means uh, asser assertion or negation, right? And then we have obligation rules. If gamma 1 and gamma n holds, holds then you have an obligation, which, which can be objective or subjective. Okay? And finally, we'll, out, we'll have outcome rules, because outcome rules are rules that lead to utilities, to agents. Right? Uh, what I, I still have to explain is, uh, is pi. I mean, RT is just a label for identifying rules, so it's not important. Pi is a probability. So we attach probability values to rules, and such probability measure probability value measure the strong uh, the, the strength of the rules, the plausibility of the rules, or the probability that the agent will use the rule in order to deliberate, to act, to endorse obligations, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Given that. We have to so think about agents as theories, as sets of rules. Okay? As an agent, my mind is describing terms of rules. If it rains, then I will open the umbrella. If it rains, I, I believe that is a, is a bad day. If I believe that is a bad day, I will be sad. Uh, okay. If you know, uh, you kill me, it is obligatory to. All rules uh, like that, right? So each agent is nothing but a bunch of rules, right? The point is that such bunch, bunches of rules should, should interact together, right? Hmm? Uh, so basically, we, we take all theories of a, uh, describing all agents, and we merge into a theory which describes the environment. Remember, all rules are probabilistic rules, OK? Okay, so how it works? Yeah, to basically we, we, we take uh, agents, we mix, and you know we have a drink. The drink is well, actually, the, the mechanism for running simulation is not. I mean, needs some technicality, but we start with the basic idea of reinforcement learning. Learning. So agents are able to learn, and what they learn depends on the utility they get. Okay, the payoff they get. Uh, there is no predetermined action that agents uh, perform. Agents perform what, is, what they learn is better for them, right? On account of the rewards and benefits they can get from social interaction. Um, so the, the, the algorithm works in that way. So agents search for the most probable theory they, may, they, uh, they have at, at, at their disposal. Then they compute the theory. They try to der derive all conclusions. Then, using those conclusions, they act. After acting, they produce some outcomes, so some benefits, some, uh, some utilities. They collect, uh, collect outcomes, and, they, and then they use the outcomes to update the probability of rules. OK? Using Boltzmann distribution this is not important, this technical aspect. So basically, if I use a certain rule, and discover that the rule, this rule is a good rule for me, 
as an agent, I will update the probability of the rule in order to increase it, the value, right? Um, and then the procedure is repeated, you know, the, the idea of social simulation that you iterate the process, right? Until when? Until you reach an equilibrium. Until you reach a situation where the, the system doesn't change. The point is that the, this equilibrium cannot be calculated easily in game theory. Because the objection is, if you, calculate, if you can calculate using game theory, for example, the re why you are running simulations. Okay? Uh, so this is pictorial representation of how things work. We have the environment, we have three agents. The three agents are depicted, uh, just have a, a single rule, you know? The probability, sorry, uh, the probability of the, of, rule, of the rule in agent one is 0 0.5. The probability of agent two is zero. Interesting. Suppose this rule is an obligation. The mental profile of, agent, of the agent includes the, 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 the rule, the obligation, but it's not active. Okay? In order to have, to have the rule activated, you need a probability which is greater than zero. And the, and the third agent has a probability one, so it's, it's, you know, it's completely activated, right? Then what you do is you derive some, you know, agent uh, deliberate, they act, they get some outcome, some utilities. These utilities are used to learn what is good. So there is an update on the probability, and you have a new theory where you have the same rules, but ch probability changed. In this very simple toy example, you have the first, the, 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 the first probability has increased, you know, now we have, we have a 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 1. Okay? And then you continue. Okay? Okay, now this is the framework, right? So now the point is how to use it in order to clarify some problems in, in, in regard to legal compliance. When, when we had to do with legal compliance, one central notion is the notion of sanction, right? Um, we work in a specific domain of the law, which is uh, norm enforcement domain of uh, dangerous activity like driving and transportation. Uh, simple scenarios, okay? Were just meant to, they, were, they were just meant to test the framework. In, in that regard, there are two main uh, models for sanction, right? One first model is, is civil liability, where, the, 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 you know, as you may know, the idea is compensation. So you have an arm, and you compensate. And there are two sub, subtypes. One is strict liability, and the other is negligence. Strict liability means that whatever you, you cause, you will, you will compensate all damages. In, in negligence, you have a due care idea. So you have a threshold below which you compensate, right? But we, don't, we didn't work on that. We work on the other, the other oh, sorry. Uh, we work on the direct regulation strategy, which is an ex-ante instrument in a sense that you don't need a harm to, to determine the sanction. An example is, is a fine, any administra administrative uh, sanction, right? If you exceed a speed limit, you will be fined. The fine doesn't depend on the harm you, you, you cause, because actually you, you don't need any harm, right? It's a preventive me measure, right? Um, we, we worked on that, 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 on that type of sanction, okay? It's a choice, you know, Basically, because in dangerous activity like driving or transportation, this is the main strategy for preventing violations. It's not the only one, but it's the, the main one. Okay, so the first, the first case is very simple, it's very classical. You know, no, uh, in, in conventional emergence of driving on the same side of the road is a classic example in, in, in social interaction. Um, so, the, the example we worked on is very simple, so we start, I, start, I start with this because it's very simple. So agents are uh, randomly paired in the sense that, you know, uh, social interaction is between, is between pairs of agents, you know. We are all agents in this, in this space, but we interact in, in pairs, right? I interact with Giuseppe, I interact with Piotr, so, okay, so in pairs. 
Uh, at the beginning of the simulation, there is no obligation. At a certain time, time uh, to, uh, to, uh, 200, an obligation to drive on the right side of the road uh, is introduced. The obligation at the beginning is a completely exogenous, so it's not internalized by agents. Some utilities are defined, so we, oh, I define potential damages for accident is, is determined for example, with this, this value, and violations and fines are, are, are established. Notice that the fine is much less than the, the, the negative utility you get from an accident, right? And another issue is that agents are artificially forced to drive at the beginning, because in social simulation, usually agents don't start. They, especially when there is a risk of, of negative utilities, they don't do anything. You need to force. So in order to start the simulation, we said, if you don't start, you will get a, a, negative, a negative utility of minus 1,000. OK? Uh, OK, this is the theory, but we skip it. OK, this is the result. So as you can notice, at the beginning, we have that very shortly, agents start driving on the left side of the road. And you know, the right side you know, disappear. Then, at, two, uh, at, at time uh, to ta 200, the norms ob obligating to drive on the right side uh, uh, you know, is active, and fines are imposed when we have sanctions, uh, when we have violations. So immediately, what immediately? This is interesting. Uh, agents start driving on the uh, uh, right side of, of the road, there is a, a small time where people, some people, some agents, continue driving on the left, right? And notice that there are two types of agents. Some agents uh, move to the, to the right side of the road because of, because of utility considerations. Is the, 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 is the uh, yellow line. But s most agents uh, internalize the norm. Okay? So there are two different profiles of agents. Okay? Those who, who act in accordance to the norm because it's convenient, and those who act because they, they inter because of utility reason in the previous steps, internalize the norm, and then act according to the norm. OK, uh, the sec uh, a second case is, is a refinement. We have degrees of care. Remember, we, we may have the different the, the, the degrees of care, right? And we have different degrees of monitoring. So we have an agent, which is the punisher, who is the police, basically, right? And we have different degrees of monitoring and of punishing, of course. Uh, for example, this picture shows a very, a very costly way of monitoring, right? The, the, this is a classic problem, right? What's the best way for preventing uh, wrongdoings in, the, in transportation with the, with the minimum amount of costs, right? Um, so the simulation is, uh, has these uh, features. So um, we have three different uh, levels of care, high care, medium, and neg negligent. Um, the higher is, is uh, the, the lower is, uh, is uh, the care, the, the higher uh, is, is the utility. So if you are, bad, if you are a bad boy, you, it's, it's, con it's more convenient. Okay? Um, there are some rules, you know, uh, governing accident, but I, I think it's not important. The negative utility for an accident is this. An obligation comes at a certain time. Um, Policy finds violation of agents whose detection is certain when monitoring is active. This is a simplification. So we assume that when monitoring is active, it's certain that uh, the, the monitor will, will, will catch the, 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 the violator, right? But the point is that we have a probability of monitoring. So it's not, it's not always the case that the monitoring is active. So the point is, what's the best strategy for optimizing monitoring with the minimum cost? Okay. Um, of course, there is a cost of monitoring. It's typical. So the result is, OK, so we, we did two types of simulation. Simulation where you have a fixed monitoring probability. And when we have 
uh, learning agent. When you have a fixed probability of monitoring, things change, change in, a uh, in a sense that in this case, we have a frequency of monitoring which is 0 0.2, OK? Doesn't work. Look, the green is a low level of care. So basically, all agents, most agents are, are acting in a, in a bad way. We discovered that the threshold for inverting things is probability of monitoring 0 0.34. After that, things don't change significantly. So for example, if you have 0 0.4, you know, look, it's, it's very similar. But in these three graphs, we have simulation with a fixed probability of monitoring. Here, we don't have a fixed probability of monitoring. Here, how is this probability calculated? Pardon? How is this probability calculated? Well, you, first, when you start a system, you assign randomly uh, probabilities unless you have some empirical uh, evidence, right? Uh, then you uh, probability change according to le the learning mechanism, so according to benefits. I mean, uh, what's the formula for calculating? We, fi we, 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 we fix the probability at the beginning. So we, we force the system, uh, the system, the rule over stating the probability of, so, uh, of monitoring to be fixed. So we, we stated that that value cannot change, OK? In these, three in these three cases. Here, the probability of monitoring changes. And uh, if you, here, you have learning agents, agents that learn from what is, is happening around them. And here, monitoring is not fixed, is fitting with the needs of, the of what's going on, right? If we, if we have more violations, then monitoring is increases. If we have less violations, the monitoring decreases in terms of probability. Remember, we have an update of probabilities you know, in the iteration of simulation, right? Um, the result is that this is the right way for proceeding. Um, we, we notice that here, the cost of monitoring is much, much less. But in terms of compliance, we have the same performance of fixed probability of 0 0.34, OK? Another issue uh, which we consider is that sort of inertia of, of the results of, of monitoring. Uh, we have, at the beginning, a peak of monitoring, right? And then we reduced immediately monitoring. And we notice that it's sufficient to have a very intense monitoring at the beginning to obtain, as a sort of inertia, compliance with a very low cost. Okay? So with learning agents and a very high peak of, of monitoring at the beginning, we, we had compliance, good, good results of compliance for a long time. Okay? So this is, and I think, is a nice result. Um, we apply the same idea, but adding something more, which is vicarious learning. Vicarious, well, vicarious learning is a, is a type of social imitation. Um, social imitation is an umbrella concept. You know, I, I will not. I will propose a reading which is which comes from social science, right? Um, for example, Bicchieri in the book of nine, uh, 2005 says that one type of imitation is called I call I call it blind imitation is when Conformity, because of course imitation in terms of do what the others would do in terms of compliance, right? Um, conformity is based on the belief that enough other people in a similar situation obey the norm. So I obey the norm because I, I see you, or most of you, obeying the norm, right? This is a blind imitation because actually there is no, nothing rational. Nothing rational in imitate that, right? Okay? Um, but there are some other non-blind phenomena like uh, vicarious learning, you know, uh, was one of the first who try, uh, studied that, but it's Bandura, right, in, 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 um, uh, in psychology. Uh, you know, people learn what to do by imitating the behavior of other agents if these last uh, uh, agents are rewarded. So it's not directly a punishment. I'm, I do something not because I'm punished or, I, or, or because I'm uh, directly rewarded. I'm doing that because I see you that in doing that, you are successful. 
But vicarious learning is not efficient in all cases. You know, I may imitate you because you are, you know, you try, because you are rich. So for me, it seems to be that this is a very successful way of, of, of living. But in fact, I can discover that I will be very sad in 20 years. Okay, it's not necessarily that uh, vicarious learning is, is optimal, right? What is the result of, vicar of combining vicarious learning with reinforcement learning? The result, so just consider uh, this, these three graphs, is very bad. Imitation in, the, consider this one, these three, we have an increase of vicarious learning, of probability of vicarious learning. The green is low care, low level of care. So vicarious learning, when you have a few violators, deviant, deviant agents, speed up convergence into violations. What you, what you said, well, someone, someone this morning said, argued that if, uh, imitation can be, you, you, you said, you know, violation, uh, imitation can be very dangerous. Well, this is a typical example where vicarious learning, a type of social imitation, not completely bl bl blind because it's driven by utility in any, in any case, is very bad. Okay? Uh, okay, this is what we said. Okay, the last example, how much? Uh, five minutes, okay. Uh, um, Okay, I will skip the example. Uh, I, will just say, I will just say the intuition. The, the example is an example where we have agents that are, that are inclined to violate a norm, but they are inclined also to punish the others that violate the norm. So, I like to, not to pay taxes, but if you evade taxes, I will punish you. This is a situation where all agents can punish the others. There, there, there is no single punisher, there is no police, no authority. A, you will have a diffused system of punishing, right? The result is that people, agents, uh, perform so-called distributed punishment. So they, they, co they form a coalition to punish the, 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 the deviant, but after that they immediately start violating norms. The result is very bad. We don't have any equilibrium. Look. We have a violation, we have a peak of punishment, then punishment slow, you know, uh, goes down. Violation again, peak of punishment, again, again, ad infinitum. In fact, there is no equilibrium. So when you have a system where agents are inclined to violate, but they are, they are, they are inclined to blame the others, the system is impossible to have a stable si uh, situation, right? Uh, a future work is to, we started already working on that, is to study distributed punishment. You know, distributed punishment is, is a notion which was studied uh, by Boyd et al. In a, you know, this is a very, very famous paper published in Science, where basically Boyd says, uh, and et al. argued that distributed punishment is, is, a, is a way for supporting, strengthening uh, co coordination and cooperation. And, but there is an, an open question. Uh, in fact, there are two ways of in understanding punishment. Punishment in its, uh, as such, or action, sanction. What's the difference? Punishment can be, uh, I mean, this is an idea which was proposed by some colleagues from uh, CNR, right, in Rome. Um, punishment is simply a costly thing, you know? I impose a cost to you, right? Sanction is something more. Sanction is norm-oriented punishment. It imposes a cost, conveys the belief that the norm exists and was violated by the target, of the punishment, and conveys a second belief stating that the cost is, is the consequence of the violation. Okay? So the interesting thing is that when punishment is distributed, then this contributes to induce agents to perceive it as a sanction. A, 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 this is typical international, international arena, right? If the United States invades some, some parts of Europe, I don't know, alone, even, even when there is a violation of international law, this is perceived as a, a strategic measure, right? When we, we have a, a different states that are allied to, uh, to invade that state, it's perceived as a, as, re, as a reaction of a violation of international law. Okay? And I, this is our conclusion I take. I can stop here. Thank you.
talking about using uh, neural net networks uh, instead of, of some defined uh, learning curves. That's that's a, 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 a absolutely correct. <laughs> This is absolutely correct. We are, do, we are trying to do that. Is, well, uh, there is a guy in Imperial College very, very strong in that regard. So we are trying to uh, plug in, basically, neural network within this uh, framework. It's technically difficult to do it, but th that's absolutely a good idea. Yeah. I mean, this approach has a limit. There is a bias. The fact that you, you, know, you don't know whether your theory is very uh, faithful, right, in representing the phenomenon you want to model, right? But has the advantage that rules are very intuitive. So they are expression, symbolic expression, so you have a common sense understanding of, of the rules. So it's a, it's a good side, it's a good point and a bad point at the same time. With uh, neural networks, definitely you have a more r robust theory, but now, now then it's difficult to, uh, to keep everything under control. But yeah, you're right. This is something we are, we are considering now. Yeah. May, may I ask another question? I understand that, that uh, you, that it is computer time consuming because we Yeah, it takes time. Take urgency. Can you have a time to use a kind of Markov approach? I mean, start to use some classes yeah. and consider probability of going from one class to another class. This is something I didn't show you. That if you look at the paper, in fact, there is everything. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the quantitative part of the story, which is not explained in the talk, is based on Markov decision pro processes. So you're right, completely, completely correct. Try to describe agents uh, by rules. Can you try already to have different agents? To have, have, sorry? Different agents, so different sets of rules. Absolutely. And to, and to find out what are the results, so you have different sets of rules interacting between the probability value. Because it would be fascinating to see. We, 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 do, we do it, but we do it in a very tricky way. So, for computational reasons, we need, we need uh, a fixed set of rules. But how can you differentiate rule, uh, the, the theories? Stating at the beginning that you in, you, in your theory, some rules have zero probability. While in my theory, they have a, a greater probability. So it's like it, it, you have in your mental profiles uh, those rules, but they are not active. So they don't count anything. You, but you're right, it's not completely different. It's not, it's not completely the same because they can be activated. I agree. I agree. This is a difficult problem, because if we have different sets of rules, it's difficult to, well, at the moment, we, we can do it, but it takes time, a lot of time. Uh, Michal Adachkevich, from Ilona University. Was, uh, this was a very fascinating presentation, and two quick questions. The first is, uh, how do you discern technically uh, these agents who internalize the law, and these agents uh, with it without internalizing? How do you do it uh, technically? Uh, I do it technically. Well, internalization, I, as I said, depends on the fact that you activate the, 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 the rule leading to the obligation, so you have a probability which is greater than zero. Um, you may act, so it depends on the rules you, you, you devise, but you, I may have rules that say, that state that you do something if you have gamma, and gamma is not the obligation, so it's simply a fact. It, you know, uh, and in that case, you comply because the action is, 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 uh, is conform, conforms to the norm, but you don't do because the, you don't derive it because of the norm. Or you may have that this conclusion is obtained because in the antecedent there is the rule, uh, there is the obligation, and then you obtain it uh, as an action following from the obligation, on account that the obligation is, ac is active, of course. So you need two, two, two things to test. The obligation is, is active. And is one of the antecedents of the norm that, uh, of the rule that leads to the to the action. Uh, thank you. And the second quick question: What are the connections, if any, uh, uh, of your results and the recent 
work of Guido Governatori on the compliance systems? Ah, uh, yeah, Guido is a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, no, there is nothing. Guido, 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 Guido uh, Guido's approach is has to do with uh, workflows and, and business process modeling. So that's that story is easier in the sense that you have a fixed wo fixed workflow is more demanding because of course since it's fixed you you have to do everything right here is complete the, the purpose is not to build the process which is compliant here we simply study a system to see what's going on okay that's a different purpose The measures of norms, uh, yeah, it depends if you have an activation of the norm and you have a stable probability. So you reach, you reach an equilibrium and the probability is, is stabilized. So according to you, at this time, you can say that a given norm Yeah, well, so in the case of conventions, actually, in the case of driving on the, on the right side of the, of the road, we have a convention. We don't have a norm, an obligation. We have just... The, a convergence into a single, you know, it, is it, we have a coordination problem, we have it, it, the simple um, equilibrium in one of the solutions, that's it. In the, in the case of norms, we, we need to, the, to have this uh, stable uh, probability value. Thank you.